please do have your Bibles open at Romans chapter 8. Page 1187. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Anybody know who said those words? Be very impressed if you did. John Newton is exactly right. John Newton, the former slave trader, the author of that <coughs> uplifting piece, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And what he's saying there is that there are really three stages to life. Stage one where he used to be. That was before God in his grace came into his life. He was a sinner who only ever did what his father, the devil, wanted him to. A wretch, the word he used himself, who couldn't help himself. The third stage is what he hopes to be in another world. Now he doesn't say much about that stage but that's where his hopes are pointing him. Newton realises he hasn't yet reached that stage. Most of what he says is about the middle stage, the second stage. To use the language of Romans chapter 7, the evil that he doesn't want to do, he still finds himself doing. Or to use the language of Romans 8, he needs to put to death the misdeeds of the body. But those statements would make no sense if he were still serving Satan. But now he is spiritually alive. He knows what sin is now. He doesn't want to keep on sinning. As verse 23 of our passage in, in Romans chapter 8 puts it, he is aware of the first fruits of the Spirit. God is now at work in his life. And where there are first fruits, there will be a full harvest. But his sins still disappoint him. Even his body is letting him down. Paul talks in verse 23 about groaning for the redemption of the body. So God's redemption is not just a spiritual thing, it's a physical thing too. Newton is really between two worlds. He's still living in this world, but he's been given a taste of the next world. And that makes him long for more. I hope that's where you are today. No longer at stage one, where sin is still in charge. Not yet at stage three, where you've moved beyond this world. But at stage two, where in a sense you're caught in the middle, aware that this world is not your home, longing for what's coming next. We talked last week about heirs of God if, from verse 17, heirs of God if we suffer with Jesus. The good thing about an heir is that his inheritance is ahead of him. It's on the way. And what's on the way, as Paul describes it here, is glory. Paul says at the end of verse 17, in order that we may also share in his glory, and again in verse 18. I really only want to look at two things today. As Paul sums them up in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory 
that will be revealed in us. There are really two halves to that verse. So we're going to, to look at what Paul calls our present sufferings. And we're also going to look at what I want to call tastes of the coming glory, which should lift our feet off the ground, because there is a new world coming. That's what I want to call this sermon. There's a new world coming. So first of all, our present suffering. And that's two, those pictures, the two different pictures show two different aspects of our present suffering. Let's look again at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul has been seeking in these chapters to encourage believers in our faith. And that's especially true in chapter 8. Although Paul didn't make the chapter divisions, chapter 8 opens with that magnificent declaration. Not just of not guilty, which is pretty good on its own, but of no condemnation ever. What Jesus has done lifts the believer into a totally new realm. Why should we persevere with the Christian life? Because in verses 5 to 13, God has enabled his spirit to move into our lives so that we live a new life so that we seek to put sin to death. But how can we be sure that God will hold on to us? Because as we were looking at last week, really from verse 14 on, we have received the spirit of adoption. We have become God's children, and our Father will not disown us. What's more, as verse 17 tells us, we are God's heirs. And verse 17 sounds for a moment as if we're on the same level as Jesus. Co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ. That's where Jesus has lifted us to. If we share in his sufferings. Now I don't want you to think there's a certain measure or there's a certain level of suffering that you have to get to, that you have to reach before God will accept you. That's not the way it works because that would bring the hair shirt into view or, or the whip that we might beat ourselves with. It's rather the case that if we share the life of Jesus, then the opposition Jesus faced will be ours as well. God's Spirit in us will be resisted by some people. They won't want to speak to us because we speak for God. It's part of the family likeness. Or to change the picture, if you're swimming now against the stream, that'll take much more energy than if you're just going with the flow it may be much more exhilarating, but there'll be obstacles. There'll even be traps in your way. In verse 18, Paul's not just making an off-the-cuff statement. That word consider or reckon comes from the accounting word. It's something that Rosalind does every day. Considering and reckoning, counting up. Counting up two separate columns here, putting present sufferings on one side of the scales and future glory on the other. Whenever you weigh the two together, it's no contest. In comparison with the weight of glory, the sufferings hardly even register. Now it's not as if Paul has led a sheltered life away from suffering. Just look on to verse 35 of the same chapter for a moment. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then Paul gives us a list of things. Trouble, hardship, persecution, 
famine, nakedness, danger, sword. This is not theory for Paul. Paul had already known every one of those, except the last one, except the sword. And as far as we know, he died by the executioner's sword. But what Paul means is that beside the glory that's coming, the suffering, even if it's serious suffering, the suffering doesn't even count. Doesn't that make you want to taste the glory? I just want to apply the break a wee bit here. I don't want us to get too carried away with the glory too soon. Although the truth is, as I was looking at this passage, in nearly every one of the verses that we read earlier, there's a little glimpse of glory. It's very hard to separate it out from the suffering. I'll try to keep a lid on it. But I think we'll find ourselves thinking about glory before we know it. Paul does like to be very logical, very orderly in the way he puts things. But it's as if Paul can't stop himself. He's taking a little jump for joy with every phrase he writes. Just look at verse 19 as an example. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. And we'll come back to the, the last words of that verse a little bit later. I just want to talk about the eager expectation or the eager longing for a minute. Different commentators tell us this means turning the neck towards something, stretching the neck, craning forward. Not like those on Centre Court or Number One Court at Wimbledon this past week. They seem to have excellent seats. All they have to do is sit and have a perfect view of everything happening. But if you're on one of the outside courts or if you're on Henman Hill, maybe it's more difficult to see what's going on. You're crammed in. You have to crane your neck to see every shot. J.B. Phillips, in his version of the New Testament, puts verse 19 this way. The whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. So do you catch Paul's enthusiasm for what God has in store for those who love him, who trust in his son? But let's look at two kinds of groaning that we find here as part of this present suffering. The first one is the groaning of the creation. Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope. There's no question that the world today is out of joint. There is beauty and pleasure. You only have to look outside and see that. But there's also pain and ugliness. All you have to do is look at a daily newspaper or listen to a news bulletin. Not many good news stories. Ryder crashes out of the Tour de France. Land Rover careers through fence of girls' school in Wimbledon, causing death and serious injury. Millions of euros damage done to businesses in France as the response to the killing of one teenager by police. The war in Ukraine grinding on with the possible use now of cluster bombs outlawed by many Western countries. And that's just from this past week. We could talk more broadly about floods and droughts and tsunamis and hurricanes and volcanoes and earthquakes. What is good to know, however, is that this is not the way it has always been. This world is not out of control. We know that already from the times that we've gone to the book of Genesis. The world was created perfect. 
But verse 20 says, the creation was subjected to frustration. By whom? Who do you think is doing the subjecting here? I wouldn't mind if you could answer. Who do you think that is? Who's subjecting the creation to frustration? Could be, you see. Could There's a number of different answers. Some people have said, this is by man, because of man's sin. The world was subjected to frustration. But man wasn't in control. Even on the day when he first sinned against God, he was trying to take control. It didn't work. Others have said, this is Satan. But look at the end of the verse. It says, in hope. Satan doesn't act out of hope for something better. This is not man, this is not Satan, this is the sovereign God at work. As we know from Genesis chapter 3, man chooses deliberately to go against God. But God responds by bringing in the death penalty he promised. Satan can't even enjoy his victory because in Genesis 3 already, God speaks a word of judgment to Satan. The world was perfect once. Man's sin has brought in the state of the world we have today. Frustration, futility, vanity. As we read in the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. There's so much hostility and strife and absurdity and meaninglessness in the world all tracing back to Adam's and Eve's sin in Genesis 3. If you think on the bigger level, no country in the world ever attains its greatest goals because of laziness, because of corruption, because of stubbornness and pride. With even the greatest achievements, there are flaws attached. For example, on a very low scale, Roger Federer won every one of his Grand Slam titles on the Lord's Day. You might work hard in the garden and produce a beautiful display, but it'll need weeding and spraying and protecting from vandals. And it doesn't last long. This lets us see what we already know, that sin is serious. Sin has consequences in the world around. God is letting us see this. Not only is creation groaning, look at verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only is creation groaning, and that means the whole world. That means even the islands that we might want to go to, to on holiday, the islands that look like paradise. There's problems there too. God's children are groaning as well. Look at verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, as I say, in all these verses, there are these little glimpses of glory. But why do we believers groan? Because we are part of this fallen creation. We don't get immunity. Whenever you trust in Christ, you don't suddenly get immunity. Jesus didn't have immunity when he was here. We know in our own lives some of the hardships I've just been talking about. To give you a simple example, I had to go down to Lisburn one day this past week to meet with the others who teach in the college. It was an amicable, a peaceable meeting. But after I had driven about four hours there and back, there wasn't enough energy left in the tank for me to get to the sermon in the evening. The spirit was willing, but the body was weak. 
Steve Lawson makes the sound point that when you go over to the hospital, it's not just unbelievers waiting to be seen. Christians suffer too. Illness, weakness, disappointment, frustration, bereavement, death. That's why I think there'll be a queue at Adam's mansion in heaven to talk to him about the troubles he landed us all in. Although by then we may understand it better. We may be more willing to forgive. So we groan about weakness, about the limitations of our bodies. Perhaps more groans as the years accumulate. We may groan too about the oppression, about the unfairness in the world around us and about our own spiritual failings. As John Newton said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. Our Christian lives fall short of our expectations. The same temptations keep tripping us up. We often hurt the ones we love most. The only good that is in us comes from God's Holy Spirit. But if you can complete Newton's saying by saying, but still I am not what I once used to be. By the grace of God I am who I am. If you can say that as well, there is hope for you. So the present sufferings of the world around us and of believers too are not minor. In fact, in a broadcast some eight years ago, John MacArthur said, the chief thing that was keeping the interviewer Larry King from Christianity, he interviewed John MacArthur many times on his program. The chief thing that was keeping this man from Christianity was the existence of evil and suffering in the world. Which is ironic, because in this passage, Paul seems to be using suffering in the opposite way, to argue for something more. If there's suffering, there's also going to be glory, something beyond to show that there is a new world coming that we need to be ready for. So let's turn from our present sufferings to what I want to call the tastes of the coming glory. Tastes of the coming glory. I just want to pick up some of the little notes I mentioned earlier. Look at verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. If you read the NIV, it talks about the glory that will be revealed in us. That is, in those who share in Jesus' sufferings. In the ESV, it talks about the glory that will be revealed to us. And actually, they're both right. Perhaps we can put them together and say, the glory will be revealed into us. St. Clair Ferguson speaks of it like a wave washing over us and carrying us along. So it's not just something that we see, it's something that we're involved in. It's something that changes us. Glory is not just a place, it's a condition. It's something that transforms us. Look at verse 19. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Creation is standing on tiptoe for the sons of God to come into our own. Now it's not so long ago that Christians and their opinions held a respected place in society. Not anymore. Although I do hope and pray that the, the agenda that many of these unbelievers have, that it has overreached itself, that the Christian voice will be heard again in our country. 
But whatever the case, verse 19 is basically saying, this is the reason the world continues to revolve. Not to make people a lot of money, not so that any particular country can be the top dog. The reason the world continues to revolve is so that the sons of God will be revealed. So that the sons of God may be seen as sons of God. And we won't have capes or fancy boots like superheroes. But thanks to the grace of Jesus, we will be this country's success stories. We will continue to stand for the values that really matter, that have brought us a line. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You don't find those qualities often in the world around. Jesus' robe of righteousness will be evident to all. The world, Paul says here, and it's God's world. The world is longing for that day because then the curse that fell in Eden will be lifted and the world can be the place God always intended. Verse 21, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And if you notice in the next verse, again there's a note of brightness. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, not so pleasant, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. The ladies here know what childbirth is, is all about. But looking at that verse, contrary to the thoughts of many global skeptics, this world is not spiraling down to die. These pains in verse 22, these groans are going to produce something new, something bursting with life. So if, believer, you're getting near the end of your journey in this life, and none of us knows how long that journey will last, if you're getting near the end of that journey, what you're actually doing is getting near the beginning of the real life and the true life. So it's not cause for regret, it's cause for rejoicing. Verse 23 not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Our adoption that we were thinking about last week, we've already received it, but it's going to be on the surface now. We will recognize one another in heaven, but we'll be so changed that we'll take others' breath away. I never realized God was doing all of that in you. We'll say to one another, our bodies will no longer break down or wear out. Listen to some words from 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's great resurrection chapter that, that spell this out. This, this body that we have, this natural body, is perishable. It is raised, imperishable. Here it is marked by dishonor. It is raised in glory. Here it is weak. It is raised in power. It's a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body, just like Jesus himself. What a day of rejoicing that will be. And Paul finishes the section by focusing on hope. Look at verses 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, 
we wait for it patiently. And Paul is giving us all these pointers to glory that light up every verse. But he wants us to keep our feet on the ground. In this world, every day, we live by faith. We don't see these things yet. So he mentions hope five times in just those two verses. And it doesn't mean that hope doesn't mean whenever we say, I hope so. I'm not sure, but it might happen. That's not what hope means in the Bible. Hope is connected to confidence, certainty. This is going to happen. But not just yet. So keep on holding on patiently. Keep on going on doggedly. However, it's more than just pie in the sky when you die. I was reading Stephen Cole, I think he said something along those lines. People make fun of pie in the sky when you die. But if there is pie in the sky when you die, would, would you rather have pie or not have pie? But it's more than that. It's more than just a, a dream in the future. There's something going on in the present that's pointing to the future. That's the strength of what Paul is saying here. Look back to, to verse 23 again. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly. All believers have received the Holy Spirit as our new manager. He's the guarantee that all of this is true. He raised Jesus from the dead. He has given every believer here, every believer in this city, in this country, new life. He helps us to do what's right, to avoid what's wrong. If he is working in our lives, then that's the sign <coughs> that these things are going to happen. The sky shall unfold, preparing his entrance, and we shall behold him, then face to face. Can I ask you, have you had little tastes of glory in this world? I have. Not often, but often enough. Normally it has been in some kind of worship time, some kind of service. As if God has just bent down and touched the gathering. There's nothing quite like it. But when it comes, you want more of it. That's what we're talking about here. The coming glory. And such things will be all the time. The wolf living with the lamb. And the leopard lying down with the goat. The dwelling of the sovereign triune God of love with his people, God living among us in the new heavens and the new earth. And how does it happen? Well, the problem started with the sin of the first Adam and spread to the whole world. Such problems can only be put right by a second Adam who to the fight and to the rescue comes who can deal with sin and the law and death and Satan, who in fact is life-giving spirit. And that's how Jesus is described in 2 Corinthians, how he can renew the cosmos. You need to know him taking your sin and all of it and giving you his righteous spirit so that you want to be part of this new world. You need to be honest about your sin. You also need to see that there is a change, a change into his likeness. There is a desire even to suffer.
for him. So that you might know his unspeakable glory. Because our present sufferings are not worth being compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Let's stand. Let's talk to God together. Our Father, we thank you for this magnificent passage reminding us what the world has become because of sin, but letting us see it's not out of control. There are no maverick molecules in the universe. You subjected the world to frustration for your own good reasons, and you will remove that frustration again. Our Father, we thank you that in your own mysterious will, you use suffering to form diamonds for your glory. We thank you that you can turn an ounce of suffering into a pound of glory. We were already ready for eternity without you. We pray that you would work in us by your Spirit to prepare us for glory. Help us to wait with patience, with perseverance. Help us not to be ashamed because you have given us all these signs that a new world is coming. We need to be trusting in Jesus. Father, we need to be hating our sin, all of us, so that we may be changed from glory into glory, so that we may soon behold him, our Saviour and King. In his name we pray. Amen. We'll close our service by singing Psalm 73C together. Psalm 73C on page 161. We sing this to the tune of St. Catherine, number 266. And these are lovely words of that close relationship between the psalmist and God. As you sing these words through, are these words true of you? Do you know this close relationship in your life? Are you looking forward to the glory bright, as we're told in the first stanza? Is God, is Jesus the most important person in the world to you, as the second stanza talks about? Yes, there are problems in this world. My flesh may faint and weary be, my heart may fail and heavy grow. We're weak in body, maybe even weak in mind, but God is still in control. The dreadful thing, as the third stanza tells us, is to be far from God, because God is the refuge for his people. Psalm 73c, let's praise God together.
fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.